Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Buddhist Biohacker. As of this morning, Spirit deemed the Buddhist Biohacker conscious content, and we are in the frequency of 1111D. That is our own dimension. So if you are looking to come out of the negative energy and some of our media outlets, this is the place to be. And I have no other place I'd rather be than with Julie Hoyle and Tari Award. So welcome both of you back to the Buddhist Biohacker. Thank you, I'm excited. This yeah, is wonderful. thanks for the invitation, right. Yes, me too. And for everybody who's joining in on the live, um, you're welcome to share your comments. I'll be looking at your comments and questions. The more participation, the better. We love it. And if you are listening later on iTunes or Spotify or watching the replay on YouTube, we also have our new private special forum on for the Buddhist biohacker on mewe.com. So if you go to mewe.com, search up the Buddhist biohacker, you'll be able to find us and we can continue the conversation from there. So I'm going to let Taria take it away. Our theme today, you guys, is called following the golden thread and you're going to follow our thread of conversation through that golden light. That's what I'll say. <laughs> and uh, go ahead, Taria. Well, um, I'll just tell you the origin of why we chose this subject. Um, Lisa had an amazing dream, which she'll be telling you about. And uh, she reported the dream to, to um, Lisa and myself. She just wrote a little note to us the other day. And it lit up something that I have been experiencing just in the recent days. And so it's like we just all picked up this golden thread and, and, brought, and Lisa said, let's do a, a podcast on this subject. So, um, so uh, before Julie tells her dream and the story that kind of lit me up, I will just tell um, what it lit up for me or what it some, put sort of coherently together with what she was saying. I have been having um, these remembrances lately for some reason, um, one never knows exactly why these memories come with such sort of vivid potency but um, the memory is of, um, this would have been 20, no, 2004. So 16, 17 years ago, 16 years ago. Um, I was leaving Los Angeles where I'd been living for 30 years and moving out to the wilderness in the middle of the mountains of Western North Carolina to start my retreat center and start a whole new life. And it, um, the move was partly um, because of a divorce that I was having. Uh, my uh, husband and I had been married for 20 years and uh, we'd been separated and were divorcing um, for a few years before I left. But this was after my daughter graduated from high school. It was an opportunity for me to start a new life. So I was moving and I decided to call my ex-husband and say, I just kept getting this um, feeling that I needed a ritual, a divorce ritual. It felt like to complete something for us, there needed to be a ritualization of the separation or, and the divorce, uh, just as we had had a ritual of joining forces in marriage. And so I called him up and I said, I really needed to have this ritual and would he please um, agree to do this with me? And he was quite reluctant, to, uh, but he did, thank goodness, um, say that he would do this. And so we decided to meet at a little park and I created just a very simple little ritual that had a big sari from India, one of these saris, and I had it in a knot and I said, now we're gonna untie the knot because we had actually done that at our wedding. We had a sari where we tied the knot. Mm. And that was symbolic of our union. So it came to me, this will be the, the ritual that we will create and we'll ask for spiritual support in helping us to untie the knot so that we could release each other. And so we went to the park and we, um, we had, it was very sweet, very simple, very short. Um, but, and we spoke a few words to each other. And w one of the, the things that he said to me that has stuck with me ever since that was so interesting, um, he kind of, 
he burst into tears basically when he was saying his message to me. And he said one of the things that really he respected and, um, and admired and, and consistently noticed about me, he said, you are always true to it. Um, and, you know, somehow I just intuitively know we both knew what he was talking about, that I never lost track of it, whatever it was that I was following all through our spiritual journey. And we had, um, we had married in a religious community. We both became ordained in that community. And then very painfully, uh, almost 20 years later, we um, resigned from that community um, for a lot of, you know, very painful and interesting reasons. So, but when we left the community, he kind of left the whole thing behind, but he, he noticed that I, for me, it was not an ending. It was a beginning of the next phase of my journey. And uh, something in him was just noticing I never let it go. Whatever it was that took me into the ministry also took me out of the ministry and was gonna be guiding me on the next ways on my path. And for some reason, um, this, this memory has been coming up and I thought it was so nice that he sort of made it conscious by putting words to it. And I just realized it's really true. I have been not letting go of that following it. And it has taken me on the wildest journeys, you know, in and out of all kinds of situations of owning a retreat center, moving into Asheville, in and out of Africa, in and out of so many different pilgrimages and uh, events of every kind all through the years, but it's always been that, that one thing that um, has guided me all through it. And um, so you'll hear Julie talk about, she had the, the word it just lit up in a, um, in a dream experience that she will report to you. But when she said that, I knew that it was felt like the divine mind was putting us together in this way to discuss and discover, you know, what it wants for us. And it immediately brought to mind one of my favorite uh, poems that I do quote often. It's by a, a William Stafford and it's called The Way It Is. There is a thread that you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. So that thread I suppose is an analogy to it. So Julie, let me turn it over to you and you can tell your dream and your story and your thoughts on this. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Taria. That was beautiful. Oh. And, you know, you know, I think what would be really wonderful would be for everyone listening in as you're hearing, you know, our sharing to just connect in and have a sense of when you throughout your life have listened to it or followed it, even if you didn't know what it was, mm -hmm. so, to, so to speak. Um, you know, and just to reference that, I, I realized that I have always been true to that. And, and that really, that recognition really became, I, I've always seen it, but it really became alive in uh, Taria's sharing the other day. Um, and it became really clear that I have been faithful to that no matter what, even before I really understood what that was. And just as one simple example from, um, you know, when I was really, uh, I, I guess, 15 or 16 years old, I failed an exam. And because of failing that exam, it was likely that I would not be able to apply, you know, do a, a do high level uh, program and then go to college and study to be a teacher, which is what I wanted to do. Um, and the, really the drive behind leaving the area where I was born and raised to go off to college and train as a teacher was because there was this um, intuitive knowing that if I stayed in that place, I would die. 
you know and this 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 idea had been there for the longest time you know and of course teenagers can be quite dramatic so and I'd only ever say that to myself I would never for example say that to my parents or to my friends but the thing is that what I was really seeing then clearly was that the dying if I'd stayed there the dying would really have been a dying of the spirit or the soul or that um, drive to follow it and I knew that that was more important than anything else so anyway I failed this exam and it looked like I wouldn't be able to go to college and I felt like I would be stuck you know in this place where I really didn't want to be and I didn't feel I'd thrive and I remember sitting in the student hall one day feeling sorry for myself and just trying to figure everything out. And I asked this question in my head, you know, what am I supposed to do now? And then this, this, this idea just landed, which was go and speak to your tutor and ask him if you can take the advanced programs and at the same time study to resit the exam you failed. And that hadn't even occurred to me. Hmm. But the thing that I realize now that I didn't necessarily see at the time is that as soon as that landed, I got up and went and acted. I didn't sit and kind of think, oh, you know, do I have the courage to do that? Will it work? I just got up and moved and responded to what I had received. And that um, response had been true for me since childhood, I'd always done that. And I also had assumed that that was the way it was for everybody else, that you would receive a message and you would respond to it. Because the, the feeling quality of the message was so powerful and so obviously true. And there was such a quality about it that I knew, you know, didn't come from, from the mind or the ego even though I couldn't put it in those words. Uh, I stayed true to that calling and I responded in kind. So I just want to kind of share that because I think for everybody listening, it's really very helpful to track back in your life and to look at from when you were very, very young, how you responded to the call or the landing of it or the following of the golden thread or, or, you know, however you want to sort of phrase that, that, that the landing of it in you and what that felt like and looked like and how you were able to honor it. So um, the other thing, you know, I've written extensively about, you know, many of these kinds of experiences, but, but one of the things for sure that happened to me following uh, the radical spiritual awakening I had in 1989 is that, you know, I used to start writing in my journal. I'd ask a question and then, you know, write it out. And then I just would trust that the answer would be given somehow. And it always was. But, you know, one of the things I found in my journal going back to 1999 or something is this kind of assurance that was given. And it was like a rope falling from the sky and giving you something to hold on to, you will be guided and shown the way. Mm. And then what happened, what started to happen after that is that I would have these lucid dreams where I would be in a situation and it would often be like in a big city that was often a mix between the US, Canada and Europe. And I'd be in this difficult situation where I knew I had to get across town or uh, you know across country actually or even to another place you know miles thousands of miles away and I didn't know I knew I had to be there but I didn't know how to go from where I was to the place where I needed to be but in the in that instant you know and obviously this was a lucid dream I was awake in the dream um, but what would happen is I'd I, this, this question would kind of land and then immediately I knew what I had to do, which was to repeat the mantra I'd been given, which by Bhagavan Nityananda in the lucid dream, which was Om Namah Shivaya, which is Om is the primordial sound 
Nama is I bow to, and Shivaya is supreme consciousness. So I was actually saying, I bow to supreme conscious, consciousness, or I bow to the light within me. So I'd repeat that. I'd often close my eyes and repeat it very fast, even though, you know, in the dream, there'd be people coming and going, and I'd be in the middle of a street or something, traffic going by and sort of all kinds of craziness. Or the other thing I would do is I would repeat to myself, Bhagavan Nityananda, Nityananda Bhagavan, Bhagavan Nityananda, Nityananda Bhagavan, because he was the one, the Siddha, that gave initiation. And within a few seconds of repeating either the mantra or Bhagavan Nityananda, Nityananda Bhagavan, I would intuitively look up, raise my hand to the sky, and even though I couldn't see anything, I would kind of feel, and I would feel this, this rope. And I'd hold on to it for dear life, continue to repeat the mantra or uh, Bhagavan Nityananda, and then I get raised up above everybody, so I'd be quite high. And then the rope would start swinging, and I'd hold on to it. And then when it got to the the, the end of its arc before it came back, I take the, the other hand and feel in the sky, and I'd find the other one, and then I'd go with the next one. And so it's kind of like you know those Tarzan movies yeah. <laughs> <laughs> through the jungle. So I would do that again and again and again until I landed. I was, you know, landed. The rope brought me down and I would be in the place I needed to be. And I was safe and then I'd open my eyes. And the thing that I recognized in the dream, no one could see what was happening. Nobody could see the rope. No one was aware of anything because they were just so busy, you know, getting on with their lives and not taking any notice of all of that. So the reason I'm sharing this stream is that this happened time and time and time and time and time and time again in dreams. I'd wait to lucidity. I'd have this question or this concern about something or somewhere I needed to be. How do I get from here to there? And then the rope would fall and, and I would follow the rope. And the thing that I'm realizing or, or I realized, you know, over the last few days with respect to sharing and presenting this is that those dreams were those lucid dreams were indicative of where I was in my waking life. I would often be, you know, in these very challenging situations at work or trying to figure something out. You know, how do I get from here to there? What's the process? Um, and you know, I, would, I, I, I often it even wasn't necessarily conscious of asking those questions, but the dream was proving and showing visually that the, the evidence of grace and the, the activation, if you like, of grace was always there to support me being able to move through any challenge, anything that was happening. You know, and there've been a, a, a lot of challenges that I've had to deal with, as we all have um, over the last, I don't know how many years. And, the, you know, the, 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 the proof of this, this connectivity is always in the outcome because, you know, knowing that grace supports every single move and, you know, every movement and is always there and is always accessible. I think what happens is it gives us greater courage then to be able to step into the unknown and to, you know, take on these challenges that appear and we can trust that we'll be taken care of. And the other thing that I think is really important for all of us to really acknowledge is that in my dream, I began by essentially saying, I don't know anything. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get from here to there. You have to show me. <laughs> and the, 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 the importance of that honesty and the importance of the integrity in that statement, I don't know anything, I really don't know anything, really I'm sure is, is, is the doorway or the gateway to receiving grace and being shown the way. Because when we admit that we don't know anything, we're really in our hearts and we're really opening to any possibility. And sometimes that's out of desperation, right? We get to our knees and say, listen, I, 
I've tried everything and it's not working. You have to help me. And then, you know, in that moment of surrender and opening to grace, then grace undoubtedly and assuredly always shows up. So for me, you know, the following it or following the golden thread or whatever term you want to give to that has always been through these, these in, you know, intuitive messages that are incredibly clear through these dreams with these kind of ropes that fall. And obviously also through messages that I'm really, really hearing when people say something and there's this huge resonance, which is what happened when Taria was sharing the other day and she was speaking about, you know, what her husband said to her about it, following it. And, and, and this really is the invitation for all of us, especially, you know, in this time of great change, is to listen to it more intently than listening to, you know, whatever's happening, you know, on the social media, on the television, or, you know, people, people are saying, coming out of their own fears. Mm -hmm. So I would really love to hear, you know, from everyone listening on the live stream or, uh, you know, during the recordings later, I would love to hear what your descriptors are, let's say, with respect to what it looks and feels and sounds like in your own life because you know the evidence of it is that you would not be here today listening or you wouldn't have any interest in listening watching the recording if this wasn't the case even though sometimes people say oh I don't have those gifts I wish I could dream I wish I could hear voices or whatever or get guidance the truth is we all do and it is really tailor-made for each one of us so that we receive it in our own way and we can see it and hear it and feel it in a way that is organic and accessible for each and every one of us. So I would love now to hear what Lisa has to say because I know she has a lot to share. <laughs> oh gosh, well, you're making me think about my own it. I mean, that's what both of you talking about it. And I think about my own experiences and I'm like running through in my brain, oh, all these things. And I think, you know, Taria, you were talking about, you know, going on your next journey. And Julie, you were talking about, you know, acting on that information you got about the exam. And I think those are like, the action is the key. The action is the key. Mm -hmm. Because when we ask, I think it's unbelievable how many times you get a yes mm -hmm. versus the no, mm -hmm. especially when it comes from the it or the that or the heart or the source or whatever you want to call it. And so for me, I think the most incredible, synchronistic, beautiful, challenging experiences I've had in my life have been from taking action on the it and knowing, I'm just trying to think of like where it comes from for me or how I feel about it. But for me, there's just, when something lands, it's like, I just know that it's coming from spirit or source that it's not me. I think there are definitely, there's definitely a difference between what comes from you and it's like, oh, this is an idea or something versus, oh, no, I need to follow this thing that's shown up. And my favorite story to tell is the Dalai Lama because it was so profound. I mean, I had, did, was in meditation. All of a sudden I'm in a a golden room with this red carpet. I had no idea where I had landed in this meditation and this vision. And I looked at the end of the carpet and there was His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I'll never forget it because I was, I'm Irish Catholic. I, I knew who he was, he's a public figure, but I didn't know anything else. And so I walked up to him in this vision and I remember like, bowing and thinking do I bow do I like what do I do I don't know what to do Curtsy. <laughs> yeah and he just laughed his laugh he was like whatever and he just said I've been waiting for you huh. and 
then I came out of this meditation and two days later, and I know I wrote you, Julie, I wrote you and you prompted me to create an intention around it, which I did. But two days later, I come home from work. I was working in fashion retail and I had a letter in my mailbox from the office of the Dalai Lama. And I remember thinking to myself, like I've lit I never, I'd never have gotten a letter from the Dalai Lama. Like, what is this? And I opened it and it was a solicitation to support Tibet. And there were these little prayer flags and and I went and I saw there was a website and I went and looked at the website and I looked at the schedule and I got on a plane five days after that to Berkeley, California, and I saw him speak. And that is saying yes to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is like the biggest yes I've ever said, I think, um, besides maybe these summits and this podcast and all these other things, but that is like it. I think it's asking the question. I've had profound things even this week alone where I've asked and been told yes in ways I just did not expect. And so for me, it's always been, I never question it. That mm -hmm. is really what it is. That's how I want to say that. I've never questioned it. When it comes, yes. I just do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You just go on the journey. You make the call. You write the email. You, you do whatever it is you're going to do. And I've noticed recently how disappointing it is when folks say no. And because it's like, wow, like you're shutting yourself off from it mm -hmm. and the expansiveness that's there. And we do it to ourselves. And I think that's pretty interesting. And I have a little story that just was a couple days ago. So my colleague, Becky, you guys know her, she was in the summits. Um, we went for a walk and we were talking about all of this. And it reminded me of something that we talked about the other day was seeking and the end of seeking. Cause she, she's a, a professor, a university level professor, and she writes academic papers. And she's also, you know, in the midst of this spiritual journey with us. And she made a comment to me that just blew my mind. And I had to share it today. She said, she's always citing everyone else, everyone else's books, every other reference, every other resource, you know, all these academic papers, everything, every PowerPoint has a reference, everything has these references. And she said, you know, every book's the same. It's just saying it differently. Yeah. And she asked the question, and I think this is huge for everybody who's listening. And I'm so curious, Taria, what you and Julie have to say about this, but she asked the question, at what point do we acknowledge that it's this? and not all of these other people and all of these other books and all of these other things. At what point do we say, I know it, I know it, mm -hmm. it's this. It's mm -hmm. not all this other stuff, it's inside of us. And I thought that is so profound within this whole discussion of there's the this existing inside of us. And you know, what point do we say, okay, I got it. Well, I can speak on that, but Taria, it would no, be No, you please go, Julie, and, I, and then I'll speak on it after. But yeah, I have things to say too, so please go. <laughs> All right. So, you know, Lisa, when you were speaking, it was really making me smile, honestly, because <laughs> the thing that I've always said is I'm so glad I'm not an academic. I, I'm so glad, honestly, I, I'm so grateful. <laughs> You know, I, I, I've done okay at school. I got, did my, got my exams. I got my, you know, bachelor's degree and whatever other certification, diplomas, all of those things, you know, wonderful. I did what I had to do to be able to hang the teacher's shingle. But I really, I am not an academic. My learning comes from the space of the heart and the recognition of truth. And I trust that more than anything I've ever read in books, ever. Um, and the thing that I realized, again, during one of these presentations, I think last week or the week before, whenever it was, is that I really stopped looking for answers from other people. Years and years ago, I think the last time I went to, and I really went just out of curiosity, actually, I went to visit um, a medium in I think 1989 or 1990 or something, <clears throat> which was a great experience. 
but honestly i have not looked to anyone or anything since then with respect to you know what i was feeling and intuiting and 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 seeing and hearing inside myself and and in my dreams now having said that obviously you know i've read books to understand the awakening process and i really honor you know, some of those writers like Llewellyn Vaughan Lee, who I love, who's a Sufi mystic, he writes beautifully, you know, the saints and the siddhas from those traditions. And I will always recommend those books if I feel that they have value for people that, you know, are struggling with whatever it is. But the truth is that I've always honored and, and really valued what I have seen and felt and known to be true inside myself and I brought that home a long time ago a long long time ago um so it's not been it, it that that whole issue hasn't been a kind of a challenge for me largely I think because because I'm very, a very simple person I'm not an academic in any way shape or form and I think it's it's easier when you aren't, uh, you know, and although actually if you're an academic, that's great too. You'll find your way and it's all perfect. <laughs> but, you know, I do hear what you're saying. There is a tendency, and I've seen this many, many times with the people that I've worked with, especially people that have belonged to a spiritual community for a long time. What they'll do is, even though there's a resonance inside themselves when they read the teachings of the master or the guru or they're, fo they're following they'll often put him or her on a pedestal you know they'll stay as the seeker and the humble you know dis disciple <clears throat> and not realize that the guru or the master or the teacher is is a reflection or, or the outer form if you like or the outer expression of their very own self mm. um, and it's very easy to remain, you know, as a seeker, because and, and that actually a spiritualized ego can be very strong. And there can be a tendency to stay in that. And that staying in that kind of identity is actually the biggest separation or the biggest obstacle to realizing the self and owning the self and recognizing the self that is 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 reflected in the form of the teacher is actually your own inner guru or your own inner self so for me i mean i you know i can't say i'm great at marketing and all of that because it isn't my you know it's like else. i just <laughs> i make it up as a go along <laughs> but um i you know really it, it hasn't been such a big issue if that makes sense mm -hmm. thankfully <laughs> one less to worry about <laughs> oh sorry, so, sorry. yeah, yeah. Uh, well i i'm i'm guessing that um some of those reflections came out of some uh a little processing I did on an email with Julie this morning, we, we spoke about, I had given a lecture last night to a, a young meetup group. And uh, Julie was there and she wrote me a very lovely response this morning. And part of my response was that, uh, that I feel a, a whole different quality of what is required of me when I'm speaking in a, in a sort of my role as an academic. Um, and this is to Jungians who are interested in Jungian thought, or who are inter interested in the tradition of um, the scholars uh, that have come before us. And certainly working on a PhD, you know, I'm in an academic role um, and having to recognize and really read a lot, certainly to get your doctorate. And to realize that you're standing on the shoulders of many who have come before and the thinkers that have created the possibilities for us to have these traditions of um, scholarship and, and uh, the development really of the, of the thinking that has gone on through the generations. So you, you know, you're required in, a, in your doctoral work to stay sort of in some sense 
true to the tradition, even as you're, you know, the, the whole thing about getting your doctorate is that you contribute something that is brand new, that is just yours, that is unique to the field. And that's what the dissertation is all about. It's about something that is that you are contributing that no one has said or done quite like that before. Either the insights are, are new, so it's a new contribution. But it's a you know it, it's a dance that you do that is sometimes kind of hard. So in that academic role, um, I have my notes and I have lots of quotes that I love them all. You know, I, I'm somebody who has quotes like posted all over my house because to me they're like art. They're somebody put into words something that is uh, that brings it. It's like a portal to wisdom or understanding. So you know, I have all my quotes and I'm doing all my things. Um, but it, it, when you have these pieces of paper in front of you and you're trying to follow the sort of the tradition of the thinkers that came before you, it's not the same kind of flow as when you just put all that down and you're just speaking from what you know. Um, so I was kind of processing a little of that with Julie. It's like, do I, you know, I, I put myself in that situation. It doesn't feel that flowing in the same way. And I had an interesting uh, experience of that too, that, um, that last night I, I gave that lecture and it was lovely. Um, but then this morning or at noon today, I did a, um, an interview for somebody with a summit and I just decided I'm not gonna have any papers in front of me. I am just gonna sit there and not at all um, uh, draw from something else. Just see what comes completely. And I enjoyed it so much. <laughs> It was so nice to just, you know, just say what I know, how I see it. You know, the words that come to me, not assembling like a, a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle, this quote and that quote and this quote and that quote, which I enjoy doing too, but it's, it's a little more stressful the other way. Um, so I had quite a contrast in this 24 hours of um, the other mode. And so your friend, tell me her, Becky's question again, how it's worded. Let me just say something. Her more. question, she said, at what point do you stop mm -hmm. referencing and citing all of these things and just say, I know this? And to give you a little bit of context, we were talking about a spiritual practice that she's learning through the mystery schools that has been copyrighted and kind of controlled and protected, however you wanna look at it. And, but these are things that are available to us as spirits. And so, and, and also she's writing an academic paper because she's a university professor. So she's got a couple of different things in these two different realms, but it's the same question of, she said, at what point do you stop and say, I know this, this is coming from me. It's coming mm -hmm. from the heart and from mm -hmm. source. It's not coming from all these other ways that all these other folks have explained it already. Yeah, when you asked that question, it reminded me just the other day I listened to on one of these summits, a man named Ilarian Merculif. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's amazing. Uh, he's an indigenous man and quite a speaker and teacher. Um, you could go on YouTube and find him, Ilarian Merculif, he's amazing. But one of the things he said, one of his indigenous elders told him um, that I really appreciated hearing. He said, these people who get up in front of a, a public group and they're gonna try to guide the community and they have to have their papers in front of them. He said, they shouldn't be there if they have to have papers in front of them. They should, you know, <laughs> that it's what comes from the heart. It comes from what you know, that that's what guides the community. Mm -hmm. um, so even though as a scholar and an academic, in one sense, I appreciate the tradition of thought that one references. On the other hand, I feel like um, that your friend Becky, you know, to that beautiful question she's saying is, you just know when you know, you just got to put it all aside and speak from from exactly what's in your own heart um, and what's in your own uh, library of experience. Um, and you just know, and you just have to trust that. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you really would prefer um, not to, you know, put yourself in a position of trusting your own authority in that way. Yeah, 
Well, and it makes me think of this, this, you know, we've been talking about interdimensional realities all day today, so I might as well keep talking about it. But I think that that's the point. And, and that's what I'm seeing or what's, what's being revealed to me is this, in, this interdimensional thinking or this new reality or the golden age or the new earth or the whatever we want to call it, the ascension, the awakening, whatever this time is that you don't have to call it anything. I feel like it doesn't have to have a name anymore. It doesn't have to have an identity. It doesn't have to have a past. It doesn't, it's just that. It, it's not anything else. Like I was even thinking like, you know, there's all these certifications and modalities and you can be a Reiki practitioner, you can be all these things. And I think there's value. We've all done many of those things and learned, but I think this time it's like, just be it, this uh -huh. it that we're tied, be it. And it manifests through you in the way that it's meant to. And it doesn't have to have references and boxes and I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, I'd, I'd love to speak to that. Yeah. So, you know, the, the thing that I've seen consistently with, you know, after years of working with people is that I think with pretty much everyone, there comes a certain point when, just like Becky, you feel that you have read just about every book that you're, you know, can find on, you know, so your spiritual journey or, you know, modalities, healing modalities or whatever it is you're interested in. And there comes a point when you sit there and you're looking at the book and you're thinking, I've read this before, you know, dressed differently or with different words, but that there's certainly a point where you recognize that everything you're picking up and reading, you know, uh, you've seen before, you've experienced directly yourself. Um, and then this, the, what I've seen is there tends to be either um, a kind of an orientation away from studying anything to do with sp anything spiritual or there's this tendency just to decide to drop everything. And the, with those that choose to just drop everything and leave it alone, that is a fantastic turning point because it's really the end of seeking outside oneself. Mm. And there's a recognition and a need actually to go inside yourself and to be with and to place value on what you already know to be true and to live from that place. So oftentimes, you know, all the practices that may have been in place before with the chanting, the meditation or whatever, the rituals that we've all had, they often fall away as well. Mm. And, you know, all of this is really about, and it's what Nityananda called the path of return. You know, he says that, and it's true from what I've seen, you know, we have this awakening experience. We start, you know, on this spiritual journey and we're reading everything and we're doing courses and programs and meditation retreats and we can't get enough of it. And we just, we're like, we're crazy about it. And we want to be in the community and want to talk about it all the time. Um, and, you know, and that lasts for a period and it's great and it's a lot of fun and it has value. And we have huge insights and epiphanies and breakthroughs. And then at some point, it just, the drive for that or the need for that or the recognition somehow that that has come to an end is so clear. Mm -hmm. You know, and I remember myself, that happened to think about five, five or six years ago now, I forget exactly when it was, but it was, I just completely lost the taste for reading anything spiritual or doing any of the practice, anything to do with, you know, any of that sort of exploration, just, I just knew it was finished, it was over. And, and what it felt, the only way I could put it is that it, it was time to put the weight of that seeking down and to leave it be. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that had any kind of resonance for me was to leave all the practices, forget everything, just live my life. But, you know, in that, go as deeply into the silence within my own being as it was possible to go. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't even know whether you can call that a practice, but that was certainly what was being called for, which is what Nityananda was speaking to and he calls it the path of return, which is actually a pathless path because it's right here mm -hmm. and it's stopping looking outside oneself or you know, in many ways needing validation or looking for another quote from another teacher or, you know, let me read, let me, let me get a high from, you know, spiritual high from what this being is saying or something, you know, so, so it's really about ending all of that and staying, actually staying here and being inside oneself and realizing and recognizing and placing value on what is here and what you have been gifted with um, and living from that space. Mm -hmm. And really until we do that, we'll be forever spiritual seekers and spiritual seekers can never attain realization or enlightenment or whatever you want to call it. Because the identifi identification with being a person who is seeking <laughs> is actually the obstacle. This is amazing because you're articulating what's happening right now for me. I mean, truly, I, I, I haven't really been able to figure out how to talk about it. And you just said it so perfectly. And that's what's happening. I, you guys both know, and a lot of you who are watching who know me know, I'm just can't get enough research and knowledge and learning and study and all these things. And through this quarantine time, I mean, what a gift, what an absolute gift this time has been. I had this experience where I went into, so when I read, when I, you know, I'm doing a, a psychic reading or whatever, I'm, and talking to loved ones on the other side, I go into this like space, this empty space. And it always looks the same. It always feels the same. I've been doing that for years and years. And at the beginning of this quarantine, I went into the space and it was different. And I thought, well, this is really peculiar. <laughs> I'm, I could really feel the dimensions of the space. It wasn't just like a dark black space. It was like this, it had all this flow and movement and energy and and I, it was different. And that was about the time that the, the OHO summits and all these things started to flow in. But what's happened is I've sort of just wanted to be in this space. <laughs> and I was working on, as a, as a yoga instructor, you know, much like the PhD, Taria, you, you do the 200 hour and then the 500 hour is like, okay, you're going to create your own thing. Mm -hmm. And this thing has been like shaping inside of me what I want to do. And it's this mix of all these different things. And I had this moment, and this is exactly what you're talking about, Julie, where I sat and I thought, what do I think? What is me and not all of these different modalities and all of these different things. And I've been sitting in that space and it's been such a relief. It's like, it hasn't stopped me from reading books or, or connecting in, but it has stopped me from needing those or looking for that information. It's like, well, I don't need to look for the information. It's right here. I mean, that's happening to me right now. And it's, I'm, I'm like fascinated by it. Like I'm my own observer like I just am like I just want to keep seeing what's going to happen here and what's going on I mean it's really amazing and I'm seeing a lot of our community our community here with Buddhist biohacker having these similar experiences of awakening in which they're like oh I don't need to look at this anymore mm -hmm. I don't need to talk about this mm -hmm. even Becky's realization you know she's like when can I just stop? And I'm like, you can. She's like, oh yeah, I can. Like, it's just really beautiful. I mean, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Let me share a little bit on that subject, on this, you know, this <laughs> reflection. Um, it's, I'm reminded of, a, I think his name. Now, I don't want to say the name because I'm not exactly sure. Anyway, uh, somebody who used to be a musician at these uh, retreats that I went to back in the day. And he was also a teacher as well. And, but he talked about, he wrote a lot of uh, just brilliant. He was like somebody who just channeled music. It was so beautiful. 
but he talked about um, somebody asking him in a bar, and I can't quote exactly, but it started a conversation where he said, it, it was a, a sort of a theory that I, I really took to heart when he said it. He said, before you, you have the authority to play your own music, you really have to learn the scales. He said, you have to put hours and hours and hours and days and hours and years into learning sort of the classical techniques of all of it. And then you have the authority to break all the rules and play your own music. But it isn't until you really put your hours and your blood and sweat and tears into learning all the techniques and learning them well and mastering them that somehow you're going to become that other musician. And, um, and I remember when I, as I think I mentioned already in this conversation, um, that I used to be a minister. And I was at the Parliament of the World's Religions in 1993 and considering for the first time the shocking idea that I might be resigning from the ministry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was totally a shocking idea because when I took my vows as a minister, to me that was like a marriage vow. It was like, you don't step away from your vow. Um, so, I was certainly troubled by the idea that maybe there was an end to this journey that I was on. Um, and uh, we were at the parliament and, my, and it was lunchtime and my uh, then husband and this nice young fellow who was a Buddhist man um, were having a conversation and I just pulled his little sacred book. He had a little holy book. I wish I could get one just like it. I was so drawn to it. And I just wanted to read it, it was all Buddha's teachings. And so I opened the book and just read the first thing my, you know, my psyche was drawn to. And it was a story that Buddha was saying about how the Dharma is like a raft that takes you across the river. And that the Dharma is so important to do all the things that you do to learn the Dharmic way. And then it takes you from one shore to another. And once you get to that next shore, you don't carry the raft with you everywhere you go or you're not gonna get anywhere. So you have to let go of the Dharma. And that was when I really started to know, it's okay, I've been, uh, I've, this Dharma that I have been so immersed in and so committed to, um, it's taking me to this place and now I just can't carry that Dharma with me forever or it's gonna, I won't get anywhere. Um, so, you know, so, I think all of this is to say that when we're in our training and we're learning the scales and we're learning the techniques and we're learning it, it's like I did the, the guru thing. I had a guru that was, you know, I, I wouldn't trade that for anything what I learned by committing myself to that learning and the discipline of it. And meditating four times a day and fasting every Saturday and living a really disciplined life for most of 20 years. And then had to let go of it all so that I could go on my own journey. So it's both, you know, I think it's, it's to respect the time that we're being trained as a Reiki master or whatever it is, you know, you're, the training is valuable, but to know that there is a time when, and to know that you will know and your guides will tell you when the time is to let it go so that you can then become your own um, sort of take all that wisdom and all that energy and all that beauty and uh, training and then just break into whatever is yours, only yours, uniquely to do. Beautiful. That that so, is beautiful. Yeah, that kind of puts <clears throat> uh, puts it together in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really does. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and that's different for everybody. You know. I think for some people that uh, studying in the studying the Dharma and all of that, uh -huh. that may just be a few years. For others, it's a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I know certainly in my case, what, what happened was I started to almost feel depressed because, um, you know, and again, I think it was to do with the weight of what I felt I was trying to carry. Mm -hmm. And then wondering how long does this, continue and then there was this thought oh my gosh I don't want to be on my deathbed saying I spent 30 <laughs> or 40 years 
doing all these spiritual practices and I still feel crappy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's you not know? following it, right? <laughs> you know? it's, it's not going to leave you there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Because, you know, because, you know, and I was being honest with myself because it was, you know, okay, I recognize I've been given all these amazing experiences and it's been awesome and so on. And I've, you know, had incredible things happen to me and I felt amazing a lot of the time. But then, you know, there were often periods where I felt down and depressed and anxious or frustrated or whatever was going on and felt like, sometimes like a yo-yo between the two. And then, you know, and I think this is a common belief when you're on a, you're a spiritual powerful journey that you shouldn't be feeling, you know, irritated or angry or upset because you're supposed to be spiritual. <laughs> you know, you feel like you've fallen off the wagon kind, of, so to speak. And, um, you know, of course all of that's not true. But but there was, an, there was certainly a necessity for me to end the search to drop everything mm -hmm. to go you know to go into this deep silence um and then you know through that there was this sort of transition and this recognition this great kind of epiphany or experience of seeing through and recognizing what has always been here prior to thought and prior to you know these kind of fluctuations in the emotions and, and so on. And then kind of laughing at it all, laughing at the whole kind of, uh, I don't want to say joke, but you know, the whole kind of drama of everything. <laughs> um, you know, but certainly it's true what you said, Taria, because, because the, you know, there has to be, I think some kind of journeying, mm -hmm. you know, and some a period spent studying and engaging in practices and being disciplined about that as well mm -hmm. um and then coming to a point where there's a recognition that that is finished it's over and i think that back to our you know topic that we started with i think that following that thread that mm -hmm. golden thread is gonna is gonna lead us through the the years of discipline through it, out of the years of discipline into the next phase of the journey but if you're following that thread it's going to show you where the next phase of your journey is going to be and you'll feel it and you'll know it. And if you let go of the thread, then you're lost. You can mm -hmm. be lost. So yes. you have to go back and get it. Yes. Right. And, uh, you know, connect in, stay connected in, um, in whatever way feels right for you, you know, and it might be very, very simple, like, you know, just spending time in nature or, mm. you know, chopping vegetables in the kitchen or whatever it doesn't necessarily mean you know sitting in lotus posture for three hours mm -hmm. no so it's really you know, <laughs> it's always organic you know it's always this organic way <clears throat> that is true for us it doesn't have to be this kind of like hard you know grit your teeth and go for it kind of <laughs> experience well, and it links back to that saying yes and taking action, because I think even if you have lost sight of the golden thread or you, you don't feel connected, I mean, I think we all have that, those points in our lives where we feel like I'm not connected the way I should be, but there's always a way it comes in. And I think it comes in through the saying yes. I think sometimes it comes in if it's listening to those prompts and, and listening to, well, this like watching the synchronicity and saying, well, wait a minute, there's something happening here that I, I need to pay attention to. And that's how you grab onto those ropes. Like you were talking about with your dream. I think that's how you grab onto those ropes is by, by taking action on the promptings and the synchronicity, because the universe is giving you those messages and those symbols to keep you tied to that golden thread and to take you through those hard times where maybe you can't see really where you're going. Yeah. You know, and a couple of uh, very, very simple practices that helped me enormously during those periods where I, I felt a bit kind of disengaged or I wasn't clear. I would often, you know, at night, put my hand against a wall, you know, before going to sleep, I would just, just feel the wall 
behind you know on, on my hand and just feel the support of that and just connecting you know a little that put my hand on my, my other hand on my heart and just connect in that way to feel something solid and supportive there felt enormously um helpful and then other times at, you know either at night or during the day I would just take my I take my hand you know one hand in the other hand and just hold the two and and imagine that I was holding the hand of a great being mm. and connecting in that way and really breathing that in for a minute or two just to feel that connection because I know that 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 is the truth that God exists in us as us or the self exists in us and as us or source whatever you want to call it and uh, you know and oftentimes I'd put my right hand over my heart and then the left hand on top and just you know connect and feel my own heartbeat and you know bring some kind of um peace and you know awareness of the oneself and because it's always about the mind you know it's all, usually the mind that's really agitated during those moments mm -hmm. and those very simple things really made a huge difference and uh you know helped me feel uh, connected back in not that you can ever not be connected we're always one with the self or one there's only one consciousness but what happens is our attention moves away from that and we go into the mind and anxiety and, you know, stories from the past or the projections into the future. And, uh, and that's what takes us out. Not that we can, can be out, but, but we, we have the idea that we're disconnected or there's an idea or belief that we need to do something to get that to, to what we, we actually already are. Mm -hmm. and we can't be anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I love so that, those, I love that yeah. hand holding. I'm going to try that myself. Yeah, it really, it, honestly, it really helped. Certainly, it helped with me. And I would uh, often do that, especially if I was traveling and it, you know during the summer, and I was staying in you know different people's homes or you know families, you know moving in with family and so on. Sometimes it's just, you know it's a different energy and it can be a bit sort of discombobulating. <laughs> So I would, you know, put my hand on the wall or on my on my heart, and that would really help. So it's just really simple things mm -hmm. to as, as a as a remembrance to bring us back to remembrance of the self, realization of the self. I am the self, mm. and um, you know, not the craziness that can often go on in the mind. Yeah. My practice is I, I actually do hug trees. I admit it here. Um, and so when I'm in nature, I have a couple in my backyard for when we haven't been able to go out of the house, but um, I put my hands on the bark of the trees and I just really feel the tree. And um, I have this thing, I smell the trees. It's a thing from when I was a little kid. And my mom grew up in Northern California and she taught me and my sister that each tree has their own smell. There's vanilla trees and chocolate trees and berry trees and all these different trees. And that is actually the most connected when I do my channelings, when I'm writing, like that's what I do. I go feel and smell the trees and that just brings me into that space of self and takes all of my fears and worries and any anything just goes away then it's like you're just with the trees mm, I, love I love that that's awesome it's amazing if you can get to some pine trees they're the best because they do really have just the sap has that smell that just it just takes you somewhere well I often walk under the um, palm trees but, you know and the palm fronds are overhanging and when they touch, you know, they'll brush against my head. And it reminds me of, you know, receiving darshan, receiving the blessings of the siddhas, because, you know, the tradition in India oftentimes is that they would take peacock feathers and brush the head oh. of seekers oh, wow. to give, uh, to give shakti path. So whenever I go under a tree, that's what's happening. I'm receiving that always. And, uh, it just I feel the energy of it and also I listen to the sound of the palm fronds clicking in the breeze oh, yeah. because it's a it's it it sounds like silence 
somehow it, it reminds me of that and then also I can hear the flapping of bird wings mm. and that brings me back to into that space and also obviously the sound of the ocean which is as we all know is amazing yeah <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> recordings from when I lived on Maui and I still play them. <laughs> Aww. Aww. I, I see Varak Taria yeah, I was just going to say I'm Taurus, Earth sign, and and somehow rocks are what I and I, they're like my family. I wish you, I could show you my little uh, pantheon here of rock beings that I that I are really. I've told people if I were if the house was burning down, I'd get these rocks. You know, the rest of it can go. But these are my these are each sort of house. You know, some form of being and consciousness that that I often when I'm sitting and doing something like this will hold it like this one is uh yeah you can't see it but there's a lady in there and she's just with me and she speaks to me while she's sitting right here in front of me and each of them has a story and an image that I wish I could show you all but um but the rock just holding on to the rock um I think can ground you into you know, and indigenous people know that these are alive. And mm -hmm. I feel that I, I know that through their sort of wisdom that has taught me that there, there's a personality to each of them. There's a beingness that supports you. And so, yeah, these ways that kind of keep us linked or grounded, you know, the, the feathers or the trees or that, you know, whatever it is, um, and all of them, are ways to, I think, keep ourselves um, connected to the thread. Yes. Um, to the thread of our own being and, the th and where it's taking us. But these are all little tools of, uh, you know, that the earth offers to us so generously. Yeah, and again, you know, it would be really great to hear what other the people who are listening in, what, I, you know, what do you use as touchstones? You you had it, Julie. You knew you knew it was time to look at this. <laughs> uh, so Eve says, "When did I connect to it?" Wow, a loaded question. I have been aware of the mystical since age twelve. I have been a seeker since age twenty. I embarked on my ascension journey since two thousand and six. Um, she said, I have catapulted into the higher dimensions via this COVID cocoon with so much gratitude. So thank you. Lovely. I think she's still writing because I see things going on here. So I'll share more as they come in. So definitely those of you watching on the live share, if you're on the replay here on YouTube, you can certainly comment here on the YouTube channel. And then everyone can go to the Buddhist biohacker forum that's now on MeWe. Um, we'll be, I'll be posting this video as soon as it's over. Um, so you guys can write on there as well, but yeah, I would love to hear everyone's stories. You know, I'm looking at your painting, Julie, and I had this like thought kind of float in when we were talking about this, you know, the, when you talk about when you stop seeking, when you kind of put everything down and I've made this observation with you and many other artists and creative beings and writers, it seems like when that when you put things down it seems like that's when the creativity starts to explode i've sort of noticed like there's this point where folks just put things down and it become they become their own it seems like people are looking we um are looking for what is ours you know what's our part or our purpose or whatever that's seeking when you stop it's like suddenly there's this creative explosion i'm just curious if you ladies have a thought on that because there is this link to the creative piece and, and I don't, I don't have any more to say. <laughs> well, I'm you know, I sure understand the question. Just say it one more time succinctly. What's the question? Well, what my question is, is I think I just want to know what your own thoughts and observations are on creatives, you know, artists and writers, musicians, like you're talking about that musician, Taria, you know, it seems like when they stop seeking, when they put everything down, when they've done their work, it's this sudden creative explosion. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about where you think that comes from or, or what your thoughts are even on that. It's just an observation I've made. I've noticed that recently. Well, I, I can speak to that actually. 
um, which is, I often tell my students when they start learning how, you know, a lot of them come with all these kind of ideas that they can't draw, they can't paint, they're not creative. You know, they got a bad grade maybe in another school. And, you know, actually a lot of students that come from the US um, have told me consistently over the last 10 or 15 years that art programs were closed down in their school, mm. you know, or it's just the option that they would take for, for an easy grade. Um, and, you know, I'd, obviously I'm t just take going on what these students have told me. I can't speak for the whole of the US, but, you yeah. know, that, that's been a, really consistent, actually. So they come with these preconceived no notions that they can't, they, they speak more about what they can't do than what they can do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the thing I always say is this, you know, I will teach you in the very simplest way possible, all the rules, you know, how to do proportion and one and two point perspective and all those things. You know, you, we can learn those. That won't take long, it's fairly easy. Then, the fun part is when you get to break the rules and that's what I'm really interested in seeing coming out of you you know what is your story what is it you're seeing what is it you're passionate about you know how do you see the world and how would you express that in color line shape and form in a very playful way and and the reason I'm sharing that is because many times with people who want to say follow the artistic path or have an art career or whatever you obviously have to learn technique you go to college and you know you learn whatever you need to learn um and you know maybe copy the style of your lecturer or other art teachers or whatever and then somewhere along the line you know and you've practiced enough to be authentic you really have to allow what is in you to come out of you in its own way and find its own voice and to step into a place of, of, of finding the courage to do that rather than thinking you need to copy someone else. And, and this actually relates at 100% to what we're saying about the spiritual path, the spiritual journey, you know, and you're reading and you're studying and you're doing all these things. And then you get to a point where you just put it all down. And, and, and I'm sure from what I've seen that the sort of the creative process, the creative journey is tells the same story because essentially creative and spiritual energy is one and the same. So if you're being true to your own creative expression and you're wanting to speak with authenticity and integrity, there comes a point where there is an explosion when you stop looking outside yourself you know or trying to copy someone that's doing well or trying to kind of emulate a certain style or use this color scheme from this famous artist or whatever the story is then then the authenticity and the integrity behind the work and the place from which that work comes from is seen by the viewer and that is what they get excited about they get excited about source or truth because they recognize it mm. they really recognize it and we also recognize when we've seen something before and just doesn't have it might be technically perfect you know what i mean mm -hmm. it might look amazing you know oh, how can you draw a paint like that but there's something missing the shakti is missing the mm. the, the, the the connecting in with source is missing and and i'm certain that that is true with musicians as well when they have the courage to express from that place within themselves that it's authentic, it just carries this magical essence or fragrance or this something that we can feel and connect into, which again brings us back to the theme because it's it. Hmm. They've found a way of connecting in with it and then putting that into color, shape or form or words or in music or poetry. And it is absolutely recognizable by people that see it. You know, and again, in the same way, like the words of Hafiz, you know, his words are uh, so amazing, so potent. Sometimes it's only one or two or three lines, but the place from which those words arose 
or Rumi, you know, he's another amazing poet, Sufi poet. We feel it. Mm -hmm. And that is what people connect with because that is what people are looking for. Mm. They come into this world from the minute they, they're born, they are looking for that. They are seeking that. And that is true for all of us, unless we're, you know, born as a, a great, already an enlightened being or an avaduta, whatever the yogi is called, one who comes in already awake. Mm. But for the rest of us, it's this process of feeling separate, you know, and the, the, the yogis again speak, speak about this, about the journey, you know, you know, out of the mother's womb and, you know, coming onto this plane of existence and feeling lost and trying to find someone or something that will show us truth. And that's essentially everybody's, everybody's journey. Hmm. So anyway, that's, that's how I would respond to that. And, you know, absolutely. It's true. I think that at a certain point, every musician or every artist just gets tired of kind of doing something in their style, but really copying somebody else's. Mm -hmm. and then just wanting to drop it all and then just being completely 100% honest and authentic with what is here and how it wants to come forth. And of course it can be scary because, mm -hmm. you know, you never know how it will be received. Yeah. So Taria. Yeah. Taria, what do you think? Um, I think you've said it all. I think that's brilliant. I think that's beautiful. <laughs> really beautiful. A couple of things come to mind in, in terms of I um, have watched while s some piano students who are like so technically perfect and their teachers or the, you know, the judges or whatever will say they're technically perfect. They're not expressing themselves at all. And, you know, that it's like there's something of the soul that has to show up. And just like what you're saying, Julie, it just it just does. And I've thought about it many times when I, I used to listen to Eric Clapton's music a lot. I really like his music, his songs and also his sound. But I thought, you know, there are people that will play a Clapton song and it's the same exact notes. And I know it's not Clapton playing that, you know, mm -hmm. that guitar. It may be the same kind of guitar, the same notes exactly, but there's something of, of him in it, you know, and I can hear him in a, in a collaboration with others. And you know, that's Clapton, that, that guitar, that one is him because there's something of his own spirit that comes right through those strings and through those notes that, um, and that's what we're looking for. And so, you know, these, these ones who are technically perfect, but they're not expressing anything of themselves yet. Um, you'd much rather listen to a messier, not so perfect musician who was expressing their own soul somehow that comes through and you just kind of know what that is. Yes. Um, yeah. And, you know, that, that's the key. Yeah. Right. That really is the key. Yeah. You know, because, you know, I'll get students saying to me, what color should I do the background? What do you think should go there? Can you tell me what this should be? And I'll say, I, I really don't know. What do you think? What mm -hmm. feels right for you? Mm -hmm. Let's explore that. You know, or if, you know, if you were telling this story um, and there was someone in this character that you draw on, you know, what would she want or what would he want? Um, because it's really, I want more than anything, because, you know, everybody can learn, well, not everybody, but I think most people can learn the basic technical kind of get some expertise. Um, but, the, but the key really is being true to you, being true to what feels right for you in terms of your own expression. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't look technically amazing and technically perfect, but what does matter is it that, that it has heart and soul and you are in there somewhere mm -hmm. speaking your truth. And mm -hmm. that's where the beauty shines through. And that's really what people connect with more than anything. Mm -hmm. You know, even though they might not be able to say what it is that they love about a piece of work, 
there's just something about the authenticity and the honesty of it. Mm -hmm. And again, it comes back down to being, you know, honest and living from that place. I love it. It's well said, both of you. And, and true with the spiritual piece too, because I think, I know I've been on my own journey, like for my own experience of, you know, what are you supposed to put out there and what don't you put out there and what, how does, you know, what do I say and what don't I say? And I mean, with gosh, it took me several years just to say, oh, I'm a psychic medium. And now I'm like, I don't even know if I need to say that. Like, I mean, there's all these things. And, and so even in the spiritual realm, I think, you know, you're like, oh, I'm going to do this exact technique. Like I do this thing, this modality or this way of reading, you know, I learned this clairvoyant process, all these things. And I think I was really blown away by a gal, her name's Nancy. She's actually going to be in the June summit. And she showed me these, the spirals, the three spirals that spiral in together with each other. And she saw these and she'll share the story on one of these podcasts, but she saw the spiral and it changed her. And she created an entire way of healing and connecting in with people from that. And that was just a few days ago I talked to her and it was actually profound for me because and in, in perfect in this conversation in that she didn't look for a rule. She didn't go study. She didn't get a certification. She just said, this is how this is going to work. And this is what came through me and said yes to it and created this whole thing. And it just really was eye opening for me as a practitioner for so long to say, wow, I don't think we have to follow any rules. This is kind of mm-hmm. cool. Like what a neat thing to think about. Like, just do what's inside of us. Interesting. You know, I mean, that's, that's a big part of that. The thread that we're talking about in the it and, and following your truth and being authentic. It's just really, you know, I'm, I'm weaving it all together in my own awareness of understanding all of this. So. Yeah. Cause you know, at the end of the day, a really good teacher or guru or whoever is really just there to point you to to go inside yourself to discover what you know to be true and what has always been there inside of you they're just kind of like a mirror actually Mm -hmm. um and you know they might be saying the same things again and again and again and again until you get it but (laughs) you know there's there's always we feel it we feel truth there's this this, it's undeniable there's this resonance you know, and it often brings tears to your eyes when you read something or you see something that has such beauty and light and integrity that there's, there's no question that we're seeing truth, we're feeling truth. You know, you, you, you just know. There's, there's, there's no room for any sort of doubt. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and that, that's what happens again and again and again and again and again, and, you know, in our, on our journey until you know as we said you you can you kind of come to the end of it and then you realize that what happens from that point on is that you become a touchstone for other people or you kind of become the golden thread for other people mm. and you continue that on in the same way that you know you have been helped on your own journey you continue that work on by being a touchstone for 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 seekers that that um are just starting out or just need some reinforcement or whatever it is but you're not actually teaching them anything new you're just reminding them of what they already know um is inside of them and they see it and feel it and then they can act accordingly so it's just it's an it's an incredible gift it's an incredible gift to have the courage to follow the thread and to recognize it and to live in a way that stays true to what you're seeing and feeling. Mm-hmm. And then at a certain point, it's, it's an incredible gift to be able to help people, you know, in their own journey and their own seeing and their own recognition. Because essentially, you know everybody's destined to wake up at some point or another Mm -hmm. and if we can all help you know in whatever way we're called then that's the best way to live as far as I'm concerned yeah I love that how can you become the golden thread 
that, mm -hmm. that's going on my social media today. Cause I think that's a great question for everybody listening now later is how do you become the golden thread? How do you take that thread and pass that to the next person? Mm -hmm. Especially now. Yes. Yeah. Because a lot of people are looking for something to hold on to because you know essentially everything's been taken away <laughs> yeah yeah uh -oh. are you <laughs> no actually i'm gonna have to go in a couple of minutes because i have a 5 30 appointment so i'm sorry to um oh you're fine i think yeah. perfect timing for all okay. of you so. all right yeah any parting words from you ladies Oh, you know, I think I've said more than enough, to be honest. What I would just say to end with is just trust it. Yeah. You know, trust the golden thread, however that shows up in your life, and be true to it. Mm -hmm. And um, you won't go wrong. And realize that it's, it's visible to you, but not necessarily to anybody else. And you may have to explain or not even have to explain to other people, but you're following that thread. Um, and uh, you have to be the one that supports your own journey sometimes. Sometimes if you're lucky, there'll be people that get it and will support you in it. Uh, but it, if that doesn't happen, you, you, just, you just know and you just trust it. And being the spiritual data analyst that I am, I think my advice is go back through your journals. If you have them, take some time to think about where you have followed it. Because as you connect those dots, it takes you right to where you are. And I think it gives you so much information about where you're headed and, and who you are authentically. So I think that's important too. That's a really good point that often it isn't until retrospect that you finally get it, what, what you've been doing all those years or whatever it is. You see in retrospect, oh yeah, it was the thread that led me through all those varied situations and journeys, right? Yeah. Just loved it. Thank you ladies so much. Thank you. I thank you both so much. And I just, I love having you on here and I just love talking to you about all of this. And thank you to everybody who watched live and joined in. And for everybody who's listening on the replay, again, you can go to mewe.com, go to the Buddhist Biohacker Forum. We want to keep the conversation going. And um, there's just so much more to come. I feel like there's more to say, but there's nothing more to say. So that's all I'm going to say. So thank you ladies so much. Have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend to everybody out there that's celebrating that or has the time off or whatever. And um, much love to everybody. Mwah. Thank love you. Both. Thank you so much. It's just been a delight to be with you in this and a lot yes. to everyone that's listening. Thank you. Yes, it's been a joy. Thank you so much. Thank Love you. to everybody. Bye. Bye.